is WTAE-TV Pittsburgh. Right now, Channel 4 Action News is taking action for you. Tonight, the victims, a memorial mass to comfort the grieving and condemn a culture of death. And a live report on the children the day after at daycare. And new information about the suspect, new charges of sinister motives. Good evening. Our coverage tonight covers matters of both criminal evidence and a community in sorrow. And to begin the broadcast, Ronald Taylor. Add soon to the murder charges counts of ethnic intimidation. The witness accounts meshing with what officers say they found in Taylor's apartment, hate-filled writings targeting whites and Jews. Let's get right to Paul Van Osdo, live in Wilkinsburg, with more on the case against Ronald Taylor. Paul. Well, Scott, I'm here at McDonald's where much of the mayhem yesterday occurred in just a few blocks from here, right at this very minute now. We believe Mr. Taylor is being arraigned on multiple charges, non-homicide charges. Of course, last night he was arraigned on the homicide charges. At this hour, he's being arraigned on the non-homicide charges, many of them as well. Uh, Taylor is on a suicide watch at the Allegheny County Jail, we're told. His attorney, Jim Ecker, says Taylor has asthma, and he was actually allowed, uh, representatives of the family were allowed to get back into Taylor's apartment today to relieve some inhalers to allow him to breathe more easily. Now, we have still have no knowledge of any prior criminal history of Taylor, although we do have some indication of some problems very early in his life. He did attend Brashear High School, and then he transferred to the Lecce School, a school for troubled kids in the Hill District. Now, we've also learned more about the weapon that was used in yesterday's crime. It was bought by Taylor's grandfather in 1982, although it's unclear exactly when the gun was turned over to Taylor himself. Now, we're also told that he has a very, very close family, is a very in intact family living here in Wilkinsburg. His attorney, Jim Ecker, says that today he, was, he gave a letter that Taylor had written to his mother, turned that one-page letter over to his mother, and Jim Ecker says his mother cried when she received the letter. Very, very depressed. They're very, very upset. They're crying. They're praying. I prayed with them last night. Uh, they just seemed like a very, very good family. As a matter of fact, one, as you, some of you may know, one of their sons is a youth minister. And the family is also very sorry for the victims of this hideous incident yesterday, according to Mr. Ecker. And uh, coming up at 6, we'll introduce you to some very close friends of Taylor's back to his childhood days. We're live in Wilkinsburg. I'm Paul Van Osdahl. All right, Paul, thank you uh, for that. We also at 6 are going to hear more about what officers found in his apartment about his evident uh, racial inclinations. Now, let's take a moment here to talk about the victims. Five in all, and sadly, two did not make it. The three others all shot at the McDonald's remain in critical condition tonight. The most critical, Emil Sanilovici of Greenfield, shot as he waited for his order at the drive through Also critical, Richard Klinger, his stepdaughter, told police that she'd just come out of the restaurant when she saw Taylor approach and open fire. And Stephen Bostard, the 25-year-old assistant manager at McDonald's, is also critical tonight. Among the dead, 71-year-old Joseph Healy, a former priest who became a diligent father and a legendary storyteller at the local library. He died at the Burger King, where he so often stopped for lunch. We spoke with one of his stepsons. He's known as Father Joe Healy. He's known as Mr. Joe to kids at a lot of Head Start programs. He's uh, Storyteller Joe, and we're all going to miss him. The kids need to know that violence isn't the answer. That if you're hurting, you need to find someone that will listen to you, find help. Funeral arrangements for Joseph Healy are incomplete. Scott? Well, four of those hit had no warning, no connection to Ronald Taylor. The very first victim, John Kroll, died doing his job, a job that took him right to Ronald Taylor's door. Shannon Perrine spent the day in his hometown of Cabot, Butler County. Uh, Shannon, I understand uh, Mr. Cole, from what you've learned, is uh, very, what was very well respected, very well liked, and will be very well missed. That's for sure, Scott. John Cole was 55 years old. He and his wife had three kids, all of them in their 20s. As you can understand, the family was just too upset to talk with us today, but there were other people in that community of Cabot who really wanted us all to know a little bit about John Cole. <laughs> Chaos in Wilkinsburg. When it was all over, John Kroll was dead. The tiny village of Cabot, Butler County, is a long way from Wilkinsburg. But for people here, the loss hits very close to home. Inside one church, ladies making a quilt talk about the tragedy. Irene Hinterleiter was less like a neighbor and more like family to John Kroll. He's just a very good neighbor man, good to help everybody. Was always there if you needed something, and he did some work for me. And 
I could always call on him if I needed something done. And his family's all so very nice. John Kroll was a member at St. Joseph's Church in Cabot. Father Michael Greb has been with the family since they heard the news. He was sort of the rock, not only of the family, but of the neighborhood, it seems, from what everyone said. They, uh, everybody that came in, all the neighbors that came in, dozens of them came in, and they all said the same thing. He was the, the foundation around here. We could count on him for everything. Now the family will count on their church and count on the village of Cabot to help them begin to heal. Just be with the family and give them all the love and care that we can, protection, you know, that they need. Just show them that we're there. We are told that John Kroll and his wife would have celebrated their 30th wedding anniversary coming up very soon. So obviously the grieving process has just begun. Scott? A very understandable. All right, Shana, thank you. Let's bring in Nina Pineda now. Right from the very beginning, Nina has been following the very chilling stories of those fortunate few who managed to walk away from their encounters with Ronald Taylor. A day of very sober reflection, I imagine, for them, Nina. It has been, Scott. And some are really dealing with flashbacks, and some seem like they're still in shock, but they are all trying to regroup from this harrowing encounter they had yesterday and trying to learn how this violence touched their lives. Staffers are trying to get back to normal, but still haven't heard from the nurse who had the gun held to her head. Yeah, she had the most um, frightening experience, the gun as close as it was to her. Poor thing, she was terrified. Joyce Ambrose joined other staffers in crisis counseling this morning. The Allison Park wife and mother put her uniform on, came to work, and did a live interview on Good Morning America about her ordeal. Realizing that um, I could die at this point and um, thinking with my faith that there was a better place I might be going to. Hard to believe the familiar pictures of people running from buildings was actually happening to them. It was horrible because I was just watching TV and counting my staff as they're coming out. She watched as we did as SWAT led the former hostages out. Okay, they have moved one woman to safety. Police have protected her. They are asking her to crouch down. Now, now here goes the other two. And you One of the doctors explained how a split-second choice may have saved their lives. And he went down through the hallway this way, and I heard the door open, so I went and I peeked around the corner, and he was standing right in that door still with the gun. Luckily, when Taylor made the decision to come through this door, he made the wrong turn. SWAT members were at both exits, and this elevator over here, somebody on the fifth floor had the foresight to turn it off. Emergency stop button. Just locks the elevator on this floor. Keeping the suspect away from easily riding up to floor three, the daycare center. I just figured if we shut the elevator off, he couldn't go any farther than the floors he was on. And some very quick thinking by some of those folks. The suspect was then trapped in that hallway. He couldn't get up to the other floors, especially the daycare center. And then negotiations did begin in that very hallway. Back to you, Scott. Remarkable stories. All right, thank you. That is remarkable. Tonight, the McDonald's restaurant where three people were gunned down remains closed. The yellow crime scene ribbon is still there, a reminder of what happened just before lunchtime yesterday. For those working inside, it's a day they will never forget. Her manager asked him what he needed, and he shot him in the head. Our manager fell to the ground, and I was like, kind of stunned. I didn't realize really what happened. So somebody said our manager had got shot. Just up the street, the Burger King where Joseph Healy was shot and killed is also closed today. Now, one of the most poignant images from yesterday's siege came when police officers led children out of the daycare center. I, I took my breath away as I watched it live. The kids held hands, some raised their hands, all looked bewildered. Team 4 wanted to know more about that. And today, our Jim Parsons spoke to an expert to get some insight on what might have been going through the kids' minds. Jim. All right, Scott, uh, we, uh, we asked if we could speak with the kids or their parents today at the daycare center. We were told that the children really it was not in their best interest for us to do that. We did, however, speak with counselors from Allegheny East Mental Health Center. They visited the daycare center this morning. They wanted to make sure that those young children and their parents are okay. And we asked them why we saw four- and five-year-olds coming out of that building with their hands up. It is a very moving sight to see children and you have to wonder what does this mean about our society social worker ken wood is talking about these images video of children emerging from the midst of yesterday's tense standoff in wilkinsburg some of the children simply marched behind armed officers but a few raised their arms into the air why did these children have their hands up in the air any any idea from you as to why children would do that well if uh, you watched the many hours of television coverage around columbine 
And at Columbine, when they brought people out of the building, they didn't know if they were involved in the, the massacre or not. So they had them with their hands up. And children watch a lot of television. And I think what their response was is doing what they had seen done on television. Now, counselors from Allegheny East Mental Health Center say the children are doing fine after yesterday's tragedy. And ironically, Scott, health care workers and neighbors of Ronald Taylor, the gunman, told us today that he himself was a regular client at Allegheny East Mental Health Center. Uh, there will be a lot of ironies to sort through. All right, thank you very much, okay. Jim. Well, time may bring some answers for those families so directly affect, affected here. There is an anguish that may never make sense. Community healing may also be very difficult. Today, many people began that process with a special mass at St. Mary of Mercy Church downtown. Tonya Caruso was there for that. Tonya. Michelle, the noontime mass often draws a large crowd, but today was especially large. About 450 people took part in a special service to remember those who died and to pray for peace and healing. They came not just from Wilkinsburg, but from all over Pittsburgh, people there to ponder and pray. And I was really saddened by what happened, so I just felt that I needed to get out and uh, say some prayers for the victims. So I just felt overwhelmingly helpless at first, and then pure compassion and need to just reach out and try to do what I can to pray and help for those people. That's why this woman, who asked that we not use her name, came all the way from Shayla. The mother of two, she believes prayer may be the only thing to help. We pray for their families, but we also pray for this whole community. And Bishop World prayed for healing and hope. Faith in God, faith in our own capacity to change this society by our ability to love and to treat one another. Prayers were said for each victim and each family. The ultimate message, we must all show love, for what happened in Wilkinsburg happened to all of us. When I saw the little children coming out of there and realized this is just across the river, and I just went through that drive through a couple days ago, and how, you know, didn't we all know those people? We all knew those people. They were us. Now, Bishop Worrell says the only way that we can break the cycle of violence is by opening up our hearts one person at a time. He encouraged everyone to continue to pray for everyone involved in this. Scott. All right, Tonya, thank you. And in talking about that cycle of violence, he called it a culture of death in this country, the bishop did in his homily. Certainly, the Wilkinsburg rampage has stood in the national news alongside the school shooting in Michigan. Today, prosecutors went after the man who reportedly left the loaded gun in reach of his six-year-old nephew. The boy police say opened fire on his first grade classmate. Jamel James, who's 19, faces charges now of involuntary manslaughter. Police say James left the gun in a bedroom in the home where the boy had been living. And in the wake of the shootings, President Clinton today challenged Congress to break its logjam on new gun control measures. Mr. Clinton invited top Republicans and Democrats to meet with him to work out a compromise solution. Michael Gargiulo joins us live now from the White House with a look at just what they are considering. Michael. Well, Michelle, the president looked at all that's happened this week and said this shows there is too much danger, in his words, in our country. So what he's asking today is for Congress to revive some old proposals and then also take some controversial new steps to reduce gun violence. After the shocking rampage in Pennsylvania and a tragic shooting in Michigan, President Clinton today called on Congress to untangle the disagreements that have held up new gun safety laws. For more than eight months now, Congress has been sitting on the common sense gun safety legislation to require child safety locks to close the gun show loophole. The House rejected a bill requiring trigger locks last spring in a dispute over background checks for gun show purchases. Mr. Clinton thinks that could have affected the fate of the six-year-old girl shot by her classmate this week. That child would be alive today if that gun had had a child trigger lock on it. But the president is going further, proposing photo IDs for gun owners and licensing them in the same way drivers are licensed. Republicans here on Capitol Hill said they're ready to answer the president's challenge and work out a new compromise for gun control laws. You know, if we want to bring people together and talk and get this thing done, that's fine with me. Leading Republicans say they can solve the gun show dispute that has kept all other safety measures locked up. These are things that can be done and ought to be done. And we're, we've offered them before, we'll continue to offer them. The terrible events of this week may at least convince lawmakers to act now. 
We have different bonds. Michelle, the president today was also blaming the National Rifle Association for holding up new gun legislation. NRA officials respond that uh, gun makers right now are providing trigger locks with their guns. They think some of the other things the president proposed here at the White House today would be too much of a burden law-abiding citizens. Michelle, back to you. Okay, Michael, thank you. And our coverage of the Wilkinsburg shooting continues at 530. What does this shooting do for the image of Wilkinsburg itself? Ted Coffey with more on that coming up later this hour. And now continuing coverage on the Wilkinsburg school shooting. The Taylor family was quick to hire a well-known local attorney to represent Ronald Taylor. Our Ted Coppy joins us now live to talk to Jim Ecker. Ted. That's right, Scott. The arraignment just wrapped up, and we just want to ask Mr. Ecker a few questions. First of all, the, the big question I think a lot of viewers are wondering, what can you do for Mr. Taylor? I don't know at this point what can be done, what can't be done, and I certainly don't predict a future. I haven't had really an opportunity to look at the case. I have not had an opportunity to even discuss the case with Mr. Taylor, except to talk to him in many generalities. So I, that's something I really would not be discussing right now. How did you get involved with this case? I was in my office yesterday afternoon around 4 or 4.30, and somebody in the family called me. They said there was a shooting, and uh, could they see me about it? I didn't know anything about the shooting. Uh, they made a point. They, I said, come on in. They came in. They were in there about 5 or 5.30 yesterday afternoon. They retained my services. I immediately called out here to the county police, talked to the superintendent, Tom Sturgeon, got permission to come out and see his, my client, spent about an hour with him out here. In between time, they were kind enough to, he has a problem with inhalers and his problems, they were kind enough to go get his inhalers from his refrigerator and get me some cigarettes for him. And thanks to uh, Gary Tallon and uh, Lieutenant Brennan and everybody in the county police, I really appreciate what they did for him. And then, of course, I spent time with the family. We prayed last night together and talked, and they, they feel very, very badly about the victims and the victims' families. With, with, with two people dead, three others shot, many would characterize this as an open and shut case. Would you agree with that characterization and, and maybe uh, speak a little bit about why you'd get involved with a case that appears to be an open and shut case? I don't know anything about whether it's open and shut at this point, as I said to you in the very beginning of our conversation, until I have an opportunity to, I don't even know what happened. I have not seen any news uh, photos of this. I haven't read a paper. I was in city court early this morning at 8.30. I have not seen a paper. I have not talked to anybody until you guys uh, ask me these questions. So I can't answer that question at this point. All right. We want to thank you very much thank for you your very time. Much. Thank you. Live from Wilkinsburg, Ted Coffey, having just spoken with uh, Mr. Jim Ecker, the defense attorney for Mr. Taylor involved in this case. I'm going to send it back to you in the studio now. All right, Ted, thank you. Appreciate that. Now, uh, one of the uh, difficult ironies in this is that Wilkinsburg had been one of the county's most impressive cases of drops in crime and then came yesterday. Continuing coverage tonight as Ted Coffey reports on the town's struggle to overcome the latest blow to its image. Just this last spring, this was a community awash in optimism. Crime was way down and spirits were up. We were down 159 major crimes last year. And then came Wilkinsburg collision with catastrophe, an afternoon of chaos and death, threatening to unravel a town's fledgling optimism. It is kind of unfair to form an opinion just based on one incident. Carrie Thomas lives here. In fact, she was across the street watching this nightmare unfold. She's seen a lot of progress in just the past couple of years and hopes outsiders take that into consideration. It's just a shame that that one incident could have such a major impact on how people view our town. Mike Hogan's a 10-year resident, pleasantly surprised by the changes he's seen. Hogan wants people to remember this. This is one of those things that no amount of, of uh, crime prevention can, can deal with. This morning, city officials found themselves in the glare of this unenviable spotlight, struggling to put an unforgettable day in perspective. We're, it's, a, it's a community of sorrow, there's going to be a healing process, but we're still looking back on the fact that over the past three years we've had some really great years. As crime went down, they were hoping the town's image would go up. The hope now is that three years of progress aren't wiped away in two and a half hours of insanity. In Wilkinsburg, Ted Coffey, Channel 4 Action News. Our coverage of the shooting and its aftermath continues both on the air and online. Check out our website at thepittsburghchannel.com for in-depth reports about yesterday's tragic events. KTV Pittsburgh. Right now, Channel 4 Action News is taking action for you. Tonight, team coverage. The shooting is over. Now a time for healing and a search for answers. We're live. Ronald Taylor arraigned on more charges. An in-depth look at the gunman. Plus, new at six, it was murder, but was it a hate crime?
Good evening. The gunfire, the shouts of police, the chaos of the Wilkinsburg shooting is yesterday's story. Tonight, we're searching for answers. The view above Penn Avenue, police and emergency crews have cleared out. In their place, media from across the country, putting the borough onto the national map in a way no one could have imagined. What a difference from just over 24 hours ago. The images burned into our minds now. Small children, hands raised. Adults fleeing an angry gunman. Police moving in to bring the hour's long crisis to an end. And when it did end, Sally, 55-year-old John Kroll of Cabot, Butler County, 71-year-old Joseph Healy of Wilkinsburg were dead. Three men remain in critical condition tonight. Richard Klinger of North Huntington Township, Stephen Bostard of Swissvale, and Emil Sanovecki of Greenfield. Now, we are learning more about the gunman tonight, 39-year-old Ronald Taylor. Our team coverage starts with Paul Van Osdell following that angle. Paul? Well, Sally, just within the last hour, the McDonald's here that was the center of yesterday's tragedy reopened. At the same time, Ronald Taylor was in court, just a few blocks from here, where he was pleading not guilty to numerous of the non-homicide charges involved yesterday, including aggravated assault, arson, terroristic threats, and ethnic intimidation. Now, when he was asked by the judge if he understood the charges against him, Taylor said, not really. He was also asked if he had any previous arrests. He said no. He was also asked if he had any history of mental illness. He said yes. That, of course, might explain what led to yesterday's tragedy. Faces charges, friends and family are trying to figure out what might have caused him to go on a shooting spree. There are clues of a troubled past. Taylor attended the Lecce School, an alternative high school for troubled kids, but there's still no indication of a criminal record. This apartment on Bentley Drive in the Hill District is where Ronald Taylor lived while he was in high school. Neighbors and friends who still live here say they saw no indication in his character back then that he was capable of doing what he's alleged to have done yesterday. Ron always stayed to himself. He never bothered nobody. I mean, he's, he's, he's a good man by heart. What is, what's going through your mind right now, remembering them and knowing what happened yesterday? Shock. I didn't know that was him. That's what it shocked me. His attorney also questions whether Taylor really hates white people. I'm white, and I'm his lawyer, so I don't, I don't know that there's anything, any racist in it. I've talked to him. He's never told me that because I'm white, he didn't want me present. As long as I've been knowing Ron, I ain't never known Ron to be racial. You but know? people say he said these things. He might have said those things, but you ever stop to think that it might have been out of anger with the man might have been going through is what set him off? Now, friends also say they saw no evidence of any mental health problems when Taylor was much younger, although the judge has ordered a mental health evaluation in light of Taylor's statement that he does have a history of mental illness. Now, Taylor does apparently also have a very tight family. His attorney says the family is grieving both for Taylor and for the victims. We're live in Wilkinsburg. I'm Paul Van Osdall. All right, Paul, thank you. We also know much more tonight about the weapon Taylor used in his shooting spree. It took the ATF less than a half an hour to trace the 22 caliber revolver they say the gun was purchased by Ernest Taylor. That's Ronald's grandfather. He bought it back in 1982 from a licensed gun dealer in Wilkinsburg. No word tonight as to when the gun was passed onto Ronald Taylor. So what was behind the man behind the gun? The disturbing speculation of hate as the motive in the deadly shooting is now a major part of the investigation. So let's go now to Sheldon Ingram with new developments in this area, Sheldon. Well, Sally, investigators uncovered new evidence that might indicate that this was, in fact, a hate crime. Also, witnesses described to me yesterday a distinct pattern during the shootings. They told how Taylor chose white victims over African Americans, even when they were standing side by side. Is Ronald Taylor a man driven by so much hate that he would kill to satisfy his disposition? That is what investigators want to know. It's a thought that disturbs Wilkinsburg's mayor. It disturbs me uh, that uh, someone living in the community could feel that way uh, and then act out on it. In addition to witness accounts of how Taylor singled out white victims, county police announced today that they retrieved hate literature against Jews and whites from Taylor's fifth floor apartment. So now the FBI is involved. Because of that, uh, there is a civil rights violation under federal statutes that we can investigate. Uh, we have the credible reports from the media, so therefore we're initiating a, a civil rights investigation. While authorities investigate the shootings as a federal crime, some people believe the leading organizations in the African-American community should step up to condemn the seemingly racially motivated shooting spree. 
So far, they haven't been seen nor heard. These organizations are based on civil rights, are based on the idea that racism is bad, then that is true no matter which race it is that we're talking about. All racism is a moral evil. Stand up in this community and say we're, we're opposed to black racism as well. I spoke with the president of the Pittsburgh NAACP, and he said his organization is thinking about making a statement. In the meantime, he said it's a matter that should be handled by the Wilkinsburg NAACP. I called that organization and just got the answering machine. But the Urban League of Pittsburgh took this stance. Sheldon, this just happened. You called, I'm responding. If it's black against white or white against black, it is wrong and it should not happen. Wilkinsburg mayor says organizations in the African-American community should not be obligated or pressured to speak. I think that, that they have to decide, those organizations have to decide if, if they're obligated to speak. I think. You know, I think that uh, uh, when they get that information, that they will speak. Now, since I last spoke with the NAACP, the organization announced that it will hold a news conference tonight regarding the shooting, and we'll have the latest tonight at 11. Sally? All right, thanks very much, Sheldon. Well, thoughts of a racially motivated crime also echoed by some of the men and women Taylor encountered throughout the afternoon. Nina Pineda talked with several of them. Nina, what do they think today, the day after? Well, Sally, two of the people who work in the doctor's office where victims were briefly taken hostage say that they didn't realize it at the time, but clearly they weren't targeted because they are black. He said, well, you know what time it is. And we, we glanced at each other. He looked at me and also looked at Tush. We, and he didn't say anything to us. Bill Simonton talked to us just after police led him to safety. But to him, coming out of the building was more frightening than the gunman himself, who seemed to indicate he wouldn't hurt them. Being a black male and actually similar weight, I mean height, my fear was, to be honest with you, when I joked with the staff about it, as far as me walking out the door and getting shot by the police myself, I was really hesitant on going out there. I would have took my chances with him to go out there. The gunman also did not pick one of the first people he encountered. He just says, not you, sister, run. Barb ran for help thinking the suspect was looking for someone in particular, not specifically someone white. And as he said, not you, sister, did you think that that had something to do with, with being racially motivated and he was looking for other people in the office to harm or? I didn't really, it did not click anything that was going on. I had never thought of race, never thought of anything. I just thought the fact that he didn't want me, he was looking for somebody else. And witnesses say that Taylor then led three women, all of whom were white, by gunpoint. He later let them go and all of the staffers ran from the building together. That's the latest from Wilkinsburg reporting live. I'm Nina Pineda. Back to you, Sally. All right. Thanks, Nina. Mike? Before Burger King and McDonald's, before the Penn West hostage situation, there was the Woodside Garden Apartments. That's where Ronald Taylor lived, and his rampage of violence began. You're about to hear from the man whom Taylor was enraged with and the woman who inadvertently saved that man's life. Jim Parsons joins us now live from Woodside Apartments with their story. Jim? Well, Mike, the fifth floor residents here at the Woodside Garden Apartments in Wilkinsburg are back in their homes tonight after Ronald Taylor allegedly set fire to the place yesterday, shortly before beginning a shooting spree. And today, the maintenance worker who was the focus of Taylor's initial wrath spoke out. Marie says I was a racist pig and it was nothing but white trash. John DeWitt says ever since Ronald Taylor moved into this apartment building last summer, Taylor has despised him. Yesterday, Taylor's rage exploded as DeWitt worked on an apartment door. This is the apartment door that Taylor was upset about, his apartment. He said maintenance workers were taking too long to replace it before he allegedly shot a worker and then set fire to the place. Ironically, today, maintenance workers are replacing every apartment door on this floor. New doors, in fact, a new hallway was in order today after Taylor allegedly set fire to his apartment. DeWitt says he won't return here to his job after Taylor allegedly shot and killed his co-worker, John Kroll. Only a last-second maintenance complaint from another tenant saved DeWitt from the same fate. A woman had called me and wanted me to come to another apartment. And it's lucky she did, because I probably wouldn't have been here. I know he would have shot me. My keys got locked up in my bedroom, and I couldn't open up the door. Clarita Moore is the woman who inadvertently saved DeWitt's life. And incredibly, while she did that, her son was trying to save Ronald Taylor's life trying to see if I could save this man if he was in there, but he wasn't. Arthur Moore was the first resident to notice the fire. He broke into Taylor's apartment thinking Taylor was trapped inside. Moore didn't know that at that moment, Taylor was running through Wilkinsburg with a gun. I didn't know he was going around doing this. I know he did this intentionally. My intentions was on saving him or whoever was in his apartment. 
Now, whatever Taylor's intentions were, those closest to him tonight are saying that his history of mental problems up until yesterday had not been severe. Reporting live from Wilkinsburg, Jim Parsons, Channel 4 Action News. All right, Jim, thank you. All right, more on our breaking news, or more breaking news that we brought you at the end of our 5 o'clock broadcast. A supermarket is on fire. There you see it in Butler County. Sky 4 up live over the scene. This is Friedman Supermarket. It's on Route 8 and Mercer Road. This is north of Clearfield Mall. You can see they have a number of trucks there. Ladders up really high over the area. Several fire crews on the scene. Emergency crews tell us that everyone has gotten out and that there are no injuries that have been reported. We'll continue to follow this story throughout our newscast. You can still see hot spots on the top of the roof. But right now we do know that everybody is out, so that's good news. Back on our lead story from tonight, it is often said that communities that go through tragedies like the one in Wilkinsburg yesterday are somehow drawn closer together. A sign of that visible today in downtown Pittsburgh. Hundreds gathered at a mass to remember the victims of the Wilkinsburg shooting. Tonya Caruso was at today's memorial mass and joins us live. Quite an outpouring of emotion, Tonya. Indeed, quite an outpouring. You know, lots of regulars attend the noontime mass at St. Mary of Mercy Church every day. Today, they were joined by dozens of others, people not just from Wilkinsburg, but from all over Pittsburgh. Bishop Donald Worrell led today's Mass with a message of healing and hope. We pray for your families. People prayed not just for the victims, but for the suspect and everyone involved. The bishop spoke of showing each other love and kindness and finding the strength to move on. For the victims, for their families, for the people of Wilkinsburg and for the people of Pittsburgh. Uh, it's only when the people get together and say, we've had enough of this. That's why parishioner Carol Clifford wanted to take part, believing prayer may now be the only way to change things. And with things as they are now, some say it's what helps them find comfort. It just gives me really a sense that there is hope out there for our community, especially not even just what happened in Wilkinsburg, but what's been happening over the past few years. And Sally, there really were people from all over the place. We ran into several college students, a woman from Shaler, someone else from the South Hills, all people touched by what happened. They wanted to offer their love and their support. And at the same time, many of these people themselves were looking for some comfort. Live in the newsroom, Tonya Caruso, back to you. I heard a lot of them say that they could have been there in those places. So uh, it does touch everybody very personally. Thanks, Tonya. Well, we, of course, will have continuing coverage of the Wilkinsburg shooting coming up tonight at 11. But coming up next, the other news of the day. Including 14 years after a rabbi was gunned down in Squirrel Hill, his accused killer heads to trial next.